Peter Himmelman is a Grammy and Emmy-nominated rock and roll performer, singer-songwriter, film composer, visual artist, and award-winning author. He has been profiled in Time Magazine, NPR, Rolling Stone, The Wall Street Journal, and The Tablet. Founded in 2011, his company, The Big News, has worked with companies such as Wharton's, McDonald's, Gap, Boeing, Coca-Cola, and the United States War Army College to help leaders and their teams experience a more unfettered relationship with their innate creativity. It was an honor and a privilege to have the discussion with Peter and to dive into how creativity shapes our resiliency. Take a look. Welcome to the Nurture Series. This is the Egg Bok Edition Season 4 with Chava Florin, where we interview inspiring stories around living more resilient lives. This month, on June 13th, I'll be doing a book signing at Barnes & Noble at 7 p.m. at The Grove here in Los Angeles, and then I'll be at the Westlake Promenade in Thousand Oaks at the Barnes & Noble there on July 2nd at 2 p.m. I will be at our Beth Jacob Synagogue on June 21st. I think that's a Wednesday night, yes, at 7.30 p.m. And we'll be doing a more intimate evening for our Beth Jacob congregation. So for those of you who are participating in that, please come and join me. Let's get into it. Look at this space that you are recording from, Peter. It's just... I want to just try to set it up to uh, be a fun place. It's a playground. It's a play. It is a playground. There's all sorts of stuff. All right. Should we get started? Are you ready? Let's go. I'm ready. Let's do it. Welcome to the Nurture Series. Today we have Peter Himmelman. He is a rock star, an author, a painter, an artist, a spiritual guru. Can I say that, Peter? Oh, man, you can't say any of this stuff, but you, you, <laughs> if you need to, you can. He's my spiritual guru, and we are very thrilled to have him on the show today to discuss ways that he nurtures his resilience. Let's do it. I'm excited. Let's do it. We are asking people different ways that they find resilience in the most difficult experiences, and you've had your share of them. Um, Tell us, what is one particular event in your life that kind of shook you hard? Well, um... Just thinking, I think the first thing that shook me hard was learning that my dad had stage four lymphoma when I was 17 years old. And uh, I had a very, looking back now and sort of having experience comparing our family life to other families, <laughs> you know, it was a very idyllic experience. My mom used to say to me, what what do you you think of our family? And I'm almost like, well, I don't know. It's pretty, seems normal and whatever. What's for dinner? But looking back on that, I realized that our family was uh, very different. Just Mm -hmm. in in the sense that everyone was, I couldn't imagine that anyone would be disempowering, let's say, of, uh, of of someone in the family everyone was like high on everyone else and trying to help them and support them and in particular my dad you know and my mom too were the the you know my dad was kind of the locus of that the center of that support and then uh this kind of idyllic as i mentioned sort of bubble burst and mm. I, I remember the first night I'd heard the news. I was a sophisticated 17-year-old. And the first thing I did, and I'm not sure that this was good for resilience at all, but I had read uh, Jersey Kaczynski's The Painted Bird. Jersey Kaczynski is a Holocaust survivor, most famously wrote Being There. Um, if anyone has ever seen that's a great movie and a great book. But the painted bird was just incredibly depressing. And I read it, and I read other of his books. And for some reason, the first instinct that I had was to dive deeper into things that were sad, morbid. Um, I don't know what that instinct, even in retrospect, I'm not even sure what that was all about. 
But that's the first thing I did. What did your dad do to prepare you for his passing? Or did he do anything? You mean during my the course of my life? N- no, like during those months that he was dying, did he do anything to help prepare you for what was to come? Well, there were, you know, the prognosis was like five months or something, but he lived for three years. So he was Marine. I mean, they don't make many of them. That's crazy. My grandpa was also a Marine. He he was uh, iconoclastic. He hitched a train from Minneapolis to Hawthorne, Nevada when he was 16, lied about his age and got into the Marines. And just as he was about to depart, for uh, Korea. My grandpa had found him and took him back, like, you know, you're out. Yeah, it was a pretty, pretty incredible situation. But I have, you know, the flag that they gave him uh, at his funeral and so on. I have his actual Marine uniform hanging in a closet somewhere. Did you play taps at his funeral? No, I didn't play any taps. Somebody, I don't remember if anyone played taps. I was in a different universe at the funeral. Mm -hmm. But yeah. In terms of preparation, you know, we we had a lot of time together, he and I, you know, before he died. I don't remember us having any sort of serious talks and things. That it wasn't my relationship with my dad. We just it was a sense of presence and mm. a sense that I knew that he admired me and found what I was doing, which was making music. Um, important. He gave me a sense of importance. I didn't go to college. So he did say, you know, um, you need to keep reading because everyone else is going to pass you by, you know, don't stop. That's the only advice I think he'd ever given me. That was good advice. I, not that I needed it. I was a you know voracious reader, but in terms of preparation, um, the foundation that he gave, which was about courage, about love, about um, sort of self-effacing, uh, a self-effacing manner when he was relating to people. And he related to all sorts of people. He would with so many different kinds of people in, in our house that he wasn't doing these overt acts of charity per se, but that's what Mm. in fact they were. And that to me was the biggest, not only preparation for his passing, but for life itself, you know, to have a sense of purpose. And, And this, you know, leads me into kind of my view of resilience. Um, I don't want to hog the conversation too much, but I was thinking about it because you texted me last night and said, you know, the subject's resilience. And I I may have a different approach to it um, as I thought about it, different approach than than many that I've heard about. Let's hear it. Well, I mean, when we think of resilience, at least when I do, it's about pushing something and persevering and doing and it's a, it's a it's a kind of force that we're talking yeah. about you know and and to to be resilient absent this other thing that I'm going to talk about in a second doesn't make a lot of sense to me so resilience let's say to keep writing as you do or to keep creating you know as as many people do, it isn't so much I need to create a sense of resilience in myself. Resilience is a side effect. And what is it a side effect of? It's a side effect of a, an intense desire, a tense, an intense will. When I have a will to accomplish something, and that will is developed and strong, and, and I just have an urge toward it, whatever it might be, the the resilience comes in its wake. It's an it's an after effect of the development of will. An after effect of the development of will. 
once you once you desire something so intensely, whatever it might be, we can start naming different things if it's helpful. You are naturally resilient to all the kind of things that will come your way. People, you know, not liking what you do, or even having less physical energy. There's a physical aspect to resilience as well. When you desire something, when you have a goal, when you have a very clarified sense of purpose, you will naturally have resilience toward accomplishing that goal. Mm. I'm taking what you're saying in. I think, you know, when you talk to an artist who uh, tinkers, you know, for a living, and the process of tinkering is being open to the possibilities, to the imagination running wild, and to allowing yourself to just sometimes sit in the quiet and the silence. I know you, you've written about this extensively. I've read about some of the things that you've written around silence and how you had to take a hiatus from speaking for several, what was it, months? Several, and several weeks. <laughs> Being in that state of quiet allows you to be in a place of surrender, which in and of itself allows you to be in a place of resilience, right? Because you're still holding on, but you're like, you said something so powerful, which is we think of resilience as pushing, but maybe it's just being still. Yeah, it's it's definitely a part of it. I mean, I, I can see in myself, I'm like, always pushing that's just my nature but i don't think that that is the um aspiration that i have right and it 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 doesn't i don't think that it's accomplished that much for me what has accomplished a lot for me which is you just were talking about is kind of it's quieter it's subtler it's more yeah. like um For whom am I doing this? That's a big one. Mm. It's a big one for me. When I write songs or, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm not thinking about like the masses. I've never thought that way. I mean, I, I probably should have been, you know, could have put a few more drachmas in my pocket, but I'm thinking about a few people. I feel that way too when I write something. I, I rarely think about a group. I always think about, Usually just one person mm -hmm. at a time. Yeah, me too. Um, mm -hmm. And there's my group of, you know, for whom I would write or do things. It's it's about three people at the, at, at the most. Yeah, I would, I would concur with that. How do you think it's changed from your 17-year-old self to your age now? How, how has the resilient practice changed? So when you were 17, what did you do to move through resilience versus today? Yeah, I mean, at 17, I mean, first of all, I'm 63 now, so you don't have uh, as much testosterone. That's its own thing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a male thing, if I can use that word. Okay, we don't have as much estrogen. We're just all kind of like somehow surviving on this planet with all the without the most important things. That we well, need I mean, to you know, those are those are interesting things. I mean. To, just to think about um, how does it feel to be, they say, you know, I, I, you know, they say, I just read once and I'm, you know, not quoting science, but I read that yeah, when a, yeah, when a man gets about. married, his mm. testosterone level lowers and he sires children and it lowers. And there's probably a sort of a natural, you know, biological effect to all that where there's, you know, potentially a greater sensitivity that's necessary. And then the other thing was, if the man should find himself single, the testosterone rises again. So at 17, the impetus was, um, well, first of all, when my dad got sick, the impetus was, it was a race for some crazy reason that I needed to achieve something very huge before my dad expired. So I should, I could show him that 
I had accomplished something. And there was also a push to, to create. I'm going to reduce this to biology. I mean, part of it creating was peacock feathers, which I would use, not that I was very conscious of it, but to reproduce the species, you know, like who, to, to attract a mate. There were primal aspects to my desire, which fueled, again, as I said, in turn, this resilience. Now, not that those things are entirely missing at age 63, but I think I what, what I really enjoy is the pleasure of creating and sharing it with people. And it's pleasurable to me. Yeah. I, I think when people are in a dire situation, like when they're actively invested in a crisis, mm. especially when that crisis is fueled by illness, there is this massive desire to um, recreate vitality, mm. sensuality, being alive, like because everything around you is dying. Everything important to you is dying. So I would say that during that period of time when you were 17 and you were actively wanting to create because in your mind you wanted to have a mate but all of that was really for the purpose of creating that vitality again that sense of living was so important because everything around you was expiring well i mean that's true and i still had that feeling at age 11 too by the way in a serious mm. way or age 9 i remember it very distinctly and and maybe it was about survival at the at the root of it and could connect to what you're saying vitality and survival i felt just by dint of my birth order i was the third in a family of four my older mm. sister got all the attention because she was the oldest my older brother because he was the first boy my this is just my conception of it i don't know that it's true sure, yeah, but i certainly sure. imbibe this this idea mm. My younger sister was the baby, and I felt um, <clears throat> in a very strong way that I needed to do something exceptional, lest I be ignored or left behind. And it was, mm -hmm. there was, there was desperation behind it somehow. And now what's driving you is just connection not so yeah. much well I, there's yeah. a little connection added to the desperation let's put it that way there's a spoonful of that good stuff but but i do see it doesn't take a lot to make a change you know you can have a homeopathic dose of something and and change yourself entirely um just to know that it's there i love that you're so honest about that you know because i think some people get to a place in their life especially when they, you know, have had a full life and they, they look back and they somehow want to show the world they have evolved in some way. And you're always very yeah. honest about the fact that you're like, no, this well, is really who I am. Well, it bothers me in a way, you know, where people that speak like, you know, ourselves and I know for a fact that everyone that's speaking is a human being. And I know no matter how famous they are, they wake up in the morning, they look at themselves in the mirror, and they think, I look like crap. No matter how beautiful they are, they wake up and just like all they can see is how, ooh, you know, how bad they look. And they feel bad at times, and maybe the, the, the majority of the times. Now they can talk their way out of anything. And yeah. it's good for their business to say that they have the answers, but nobody has the answers. We have some suggestions that could help or that have helped us at times, but they're not solutions. That's the other thing people are looking for. I think you might have even mentioned the word hacks. You know, I'm a little resistant to that word. Somebody, asked me if I wanted to develop an app. It was a big medical company um, and to do 
brain hacks for creativity, and it would be on an app. And I said to him, look, he was flashing around money. There was a people, VC people on the call. I'm like, look, this putting in more stuff on a on an app on a phone is not going to help anyone with creativity and and getting creativity by a hack is the antithesis of how it happens how about this why don't you curl up in a fetal ball and cry and cry in the shower and why don't you you know hug a child and 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 weep with joy. I mean, feel, like you said, feel aliveness. How can you make a brain hack out of that? It's impossible. We are a meat pack. We're temporal beings, physical beings with whatever you want to call it, some sort of, I, I think of it as, well, however you would, you know, anthropomorphize a spirit, it's impossible to imagine, but some animating force. I'm very cognizant of that, that there's this constant duality. And it's not, well, tell me how you get yourself balanced. It isn't a question of getting myself balanced. It's a question of me not falling on the floor because we're always tipping over at every second. Nobody has balance. That's a, it's a false premise. And when people find that that's something achievable or they believe it is and they were told it is and they don't have it, they feel miserable. Now, you know, some people use deodorant and they have credit cards and they say, well, you know, actually, and they talk like they know things. But of course, they're doing that because they don't want to seem abnormal. But everyone's abnormal. Here's the proof. We live with a third or so, depending, a quarter, a fifth of our lives, dreaming that we're backwards on a penguin speaking Portuguese. That's at night when we dream. And then we wake up and we open up the Wall Street Journal in the morning. And we pretend for all the world that we're normal, but we still can't get our mind off that penguin speaking Portuguese. All day <laughs> long, we think about it. People are weird. You and know, don't I ever forget that. Beautiful and weird. No one is normal. And and yeah. and everyone's an artist this in a way striving too. that everybody has, right? To get like healthy or normal or to be like, you know, standing out in the species in some way. And what you're saying is, is that it's just not even worth the trying. All of a sudden I have like acne on my nose, and I'm like, I gotta stop at <laughs> CVS near the fish grill and get like this. It helped. I mean, I don't who wants acne on their nose? You want to look good. But, okay, but, okay, so I would consider that a hack, right? I would consider that like what I mean by hack is there are certain things that you can do sure, to help right. make the crazy feel a little less crazy. <laughs> You're never going to truly fix crazy because like the byproduct of being human is that we're a little out of whack. Like we're not normal. We're living this dual life like you talked about. And I wrote about that too is that you know we're these physical creatures trying to have a spiritual experience and it's uh it's a constant struggle it's exhausting but there are certain little things that i think people pick up on doing who have had more suffering in their life than others that they go okay i really rely on this this is my thing and i guess for you you know knowing you as long as i have for you it is creating like if you didn't have creativity just imagine just how messed up you'd be, <laughs> right? Mm. Like that is your hack. That's how you get through those like uncomfortable. Yeah, it is true. It, and if I had a hack, I wouldn't, you know, also I would broaden the subject of creativity. I would broaden it way out. You know, th this conversation is is now verging on creative. You know, I think it's, it's always you know, does. Cause we're making up some new stuff. If yes, people go on these interviews and you hear interview to interview, it's always the same thing. Look, That's right. at least a third of what we say is going to be stuff we've said before, because what else would we do? And the rest of it is an improvisation. And the improvisation is creative. You know, being with a spouse, being with children, being with friends, uh, that can be and is a creative act 
if it's done in a way that isn't by rote, if it's challenging new things, cooking is also creative, taking a walk. I mean, look, life is itself. And put this in quotes on the thing because it's coming out and it's, give me a drum roll. You know, it by, by its nature, it's creative. Every moment is creative. The, crowd, the question is then, how do we keep track of it? How do we see this wonder? Let's say that there was a time when, you know how you sometimes you go, oh my God, it was just, it was a, I, it was a miracle. Let's say a child is born and you, you are for a moment transported or your world is enlarged to such a degree or something happened to me a few years ago where I was with my kids in a car and my wife and coming home from a restaurant and there was a green light and you know it was our turn to, to go everyone was going and it kind of stopped it pu turned, pushed pushed on the brakes for no reason and all of a sudden this car went like 80 miles an hour we would have been killed it was like this prescient moment mm. now that was to me like oh that's a singular thing the veil parted for a moment but what yeah. if the veils if i'm making any sense here were constantly parted and you could see the connections between people. All the miracle was revealed to you just plain as day. Would we not then miss? We would not be missing that time, which is now, where you'd have to search for that. And the joy and delight of having found something that's so surprising, wouldn't we mourn the loss of that? if that miracle was constantly before us. What you're talking about is the pursuit within curiosity or the pursuit of curiosity, which is what is the tension mm -hmm. of being and exploring. Right. The pursuit, which has its danger, the pursuit of curiosity to you know what is the hunt the hunt isn't necessarily for curiosity curiosity is the tool the path and down that path you're you're hunting for these gems and the gems yeah. are oh my god you know the ultimate gem is a, an awareness of your own aliveness this is very very rare you can count on one hand if you're lucky the times that's ever happened we have this stark realization that you were alive. It seems to me that when some tragic things happen to me, my sister got killed in a car accident. And for yeah. a few days, I was in that state. It wasn't, you know, it was horrible. The whole thing was, but that was a, was a silver lining. I was gleaning were, these insights. Oh, I see. You are noticing like the that relationships it sounds like really stupid because you you know that it's relationships are are elemental they're so important we know it but we're not feeling it you know it it's a it's an intellectualized concept but here you're thrust into it in a way that it's visceral yeah. Now, look, you can have the same feeling from the birth of a grandchild, which we've had, Kanaina Hira, two of them. You're already feeling that's what you're, that's what you really want. That's the blessing to have this feeling through joy and get it sure. just as potently through joy. Three days after my dad passed away, uh, I woke up at like 5 30 in the morning and tears were just flowing out of my eyes, covering my face. And I had this extremely real experience where he came to me. And I will never forget it because it felt as real as I am talking to you. That's how it felt. It did not feel like a dream. 
And he sat at my bed and just looked at me with this face of like, I'm so sorry this happened. You know, there was no words. It was all just what was said between us from heart to heart. And I think to myself, in all the memories I have with my father, and there were hundreds, right? You know, that moment is probably the holiest, most memorable moment because it was just, it was after the physicalness had been, you know, suspended. There was something that happened that was in in between the matrix or in between the the time and the space. It was beyond that. And um, I often go back to that memory of being with him in that state because it's like the closest I could feel to holiness, you know, mm. the closest I could feel to where. I'm not grounded in this world, suspended by my physicality, but there's something higher, deeper, greater to search for, to be in wonder over. And I I think what you were saying about after your sister passed away and it was so visceral and surprising, shocking, that when you go through um, a loss like that, where the person's soul is just torn out of the world, this world, you know, it, it forces you to, um, not just question everything, but also see the world like without the curtain, with the curtain pulled back, Mm. like you were saying in that moment when you were driving. And I think we, we, um, we get really excited when we see that, when we have those moments of wondering, of wonderment, like, whoa, I just saw something. I just felt that, you know, because it makes us feel like there's more than just what meets the eye. You know, we can suspend this feeling of just being so grounded in reality. Our reality can take on new meaning. It could have, you know, like this universe of experience that we that we yearn for i think that's why when when you hear a song or you see a piece of art that is so profound that like it it makes you fly like go higher than where we are in this world you know that's kind of the what i think you're talking about am i correct like that pursuit of imagining that there's something greater that we are dying to know and yet we'll never know. We just have to kind of know. You know, I wonder too. Yeah, I like what you're saying. I I concur. I think there are people for whom this kind of thing, well, I, I know for a fact, at least that's what they say, it's doesn't it's not meaningful. It's not something that they're ever thinking about. I mean, imagine in certain instances they might be like, you know, at the, things that we're talking about right now, like a great loss. But in the in the normal day, they're not really thinking about this, and they wonder why is it so interesting um, that some people are born, and it's not better, certainly better or worse, it's just a unique quality, that are more concerned with this idea. Yeah. Um, I do find it, I guess um, I hang around a lot of musicians, and <clears throat> the best of them can really ease into this conversation. Um, they can attain it, you know, with less effort. They're shaping their reality with their own creative expression that they know is beyond them. The idea of music being invisible, intangible, untemporal. Yes. It's mm-hmm. you're you're working with a medium that has no substance. Right. Which is you might liken it to some might liken it to a spiritual thing. I mean, I could see the connection to that. I was also thinking about something else. I lost a, a, a scarf a couple of years ago at the YMCA. 
not a great scarf, <clears throat> nothing that I was like so interested in, but it really bothered me that I lost it. It just yeah. like, and then a month or more after it was gone, somebody at the Y called me and said, well, I think we found your scarf. A scarf. I probably got it at like, you know, who knows where, Macy's. And I went to the Y and I got my scarf and I was so incredibly happy. Like happy in a way that I shouldn't have been. Happy beyond what was normal. And I'm thinking, and, and that's if you think about when you lose your keys and you find them, you're you're excited. Now, why weren't oh, I you lost excited? My phone. I lost my phone three days ago. Yeah, gone. I didn't, and oh, it's gone from now forever. No, no, no. I lost it. It was absolutely gone. I was like, I searched yeah. everywhere that I could have possibly put it, and I was just like, "This is going to be annoying." There's a lot that I have to do. So, to like, what happened when did you find it? Well, we put Robbie on it because he, I lose things all the time and Robbie finds them for me. <laughs> and what happened? Part of my ADHD. And uh, Robbie starts calling the phone and calling and calling. And then someone picked up and he's like, yeah, I saw the phone on the floor outside. I had gone outside earlier to send a gift to somebody, send a book to someone. And I guess I dropped it. And I, I didn't even notice that I dropped it. This guy <laughs> picks it up. He lives like six blocks up. He's like, right, come and get my, it. My question is, how did you feel the moment it was returned? Like so relieved, <laughs> elated. Yeah. But also I always think about these interruptions. I'm always very cognizant that when there's an interruption like that to go, okay, what was the reason for the interruption? What am I seeing? What should I see? What should I notice? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's crazy. It you know, spend a lot of time doing that when you should be like following your taxes. I'm the same way. Like what, why? But I think that the, the outsized joy of being reunited with something that you've lost. Now this is the most microcosmic dose possible, like, like infinitely microcosmic, but it does lead me to think about reuniting in some unknowable seemingly impossible way with my dad or my my sister and wow. what the joy would be if i were to be reunited with them and every time i found a simple lost object and i feel that joy like a key that i lost recently like a you know i could buy another one i was like oh there's something about it that resonated far beyond what it is that leads me to think about the the reunion of things that we think are forever lost and what that would feel like wow that's heavy <laughs> that's really beautiful we're not going to talk about our tribe's tradition but that is one of our fundamental articles of faith and how we process that idea is uh it's up to the individual nobody knows exactly how that goes yeah i think that is what makes artists so you know, beautiful in this world is that they can take something like losing a scarf and turn it into a uh, primordial spiritual exercise, you know? I mean, you know, you have engineers who are in some way artists, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the, if you look at bridges, and I've just been like reading about this guy, Robert Moses, who really, if you ever read about him in the 20s, how he basically built New York, mm. all the parks, all the roads, all everything, and the engineers that, that he got. And they build physical structures, and they're, they're literally crucial for life, you know. And then without some 
people to imbue the whole system with meaning, it would be so cold. And if there weren't engineers and all you have with this floaty, you know, ephemeral ideas, you would be dead. I mean, so there's a perfect synergy. And even in terms of the creation of our, our music, there is that duality of structure. If you if you eschew the structure, you'll have nothing. And if you have only cold structure, you'll also have nothing. So that reminds me of the duality that we're talking about before, the body and the spirit, if you will. You know, that makes a human being, and you can't leave either one aside. You write a lot about that. Um, I've written a lot about that as well. I think there is something um, wondrous that is, that forces our curiosity to continue to strive for that creativity. And I wonder, like, you were saying how when you were 17 and you were super creative, it was because you were, you know, trying to inject yourself in this universe. Like, here I am, right? Yeah, you know, now, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't so much that. The, I, the things that I think about now, I thought about then too. I didn't have the courage or the familiarity with this I, these ideas to really talk to them. I didn't have resources and have people to talk about this stuff with. Right. So would, I, would you say that today, moving through your creativity, and of course, that is sort of your resilient hack, Go if you will. To, yeah, yeah, I know you don't like right. that word. No, you're right. But would, would you say that, that what fuels that is creating connection? Well, it does do that. I mean, that's one thing. Um, I so think not I, searching for the wonderment and also creating connection. Mm -hmm. When I, um, I mean, if I'm creating part of that, back to the original thing I was talking about, will. My will is for something to appear, whether I'm writing or making music or you know doing some art. You know, I, I want the thing to appear, but also I'm primarily looking for someone to share it with and create a reaction and a connection, as you say. I mean, that's that's the driver of the will, which creates the resilience. Now, I've been talking mostly about resilience in, in terms of continue with art or something. But as you bring up this idea of resilience through a very challenging, even traumatic experience. And it goes a little deeper. And then the quest is not a quest, but it's a it's almost a life-saving need to have people around you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember they, a few yeah. years ago, obviously was losing it, and I called oh. you and I was like what am I doing this for? This is such a waste of my time. Why am I doing this? This is so crazy, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I was like spiraling. Mm. And I remember you said, you're forcing this reaction or you're doing it to create a reaction instead of just doing it for the sake of doing it. Like the first step is to, I think, like what you had said to me was the first step of creation is not the reaction. If you're only doing it for reaction, then you're, you're not really in creative mode. You're just in like uh, ego mode. Right. But like if yeah. you're creating for the sake of creating and that becomes your whole thing, the reaction is just secondary. Well, I would add to that. I know what you're saying. I believe it. <clears throat> there isn't in my experience, <clears throat> the experience that I've gleaned from other people, there isn't purity in that, that you're doing it for the sake of the experience. It's not pure. That doesn't mean when I say the other side is impure. It comes and goes. There's moments of this purity where you're just doing it for the doing and the joy of it. And then, then there's also an expectation. There's moments of, <clears throat> anticipating a, a positive reaction or any reaction at all, because the worst thing is apathy. 
Um, and it comes and goes. If you have a situation where there's primarily or fundamentally this need to create a reaction, um, I think the work that you do, I can only imagine for myself, it, it would suffer. And sometimes my work has suffered many times where primarily it's for a reaction. Absolutely. It's very rare, as a matter of fact, to have the primary idea just in the doing. But look, if you don't do it all the time, if this isn't your, let's say, your practice, you're constantly writing or whatever it is that you do, or cooking or you know, socializing, what the, all these creative acts, if you're not doing it a lot, you don't really understand the ebb and flow of it. Right. And it's by, it's just by like anything, you develop a sense of both of expectation, here's how the process will lay out. And then you also understand the gift of surprise. I've done some things that have just been horrible throwaways and then i thought well let me see what's here yes. so maybe it was a throwaway when i was thinking of you know garnering attention and i came back to it to see is there a seed here is there something yeah. vital and now i'm just looking at that and being curious about that for its own sake but it yeah. isn't it isn't continuous and no one should feel bad if they if they don't have the purity of intention going the whole time, it's not possible because we are this duality and it's always going to, it's going to show up in our work and maybe it's a question of proportion. Yeah. I, I think it is a question of proportion because I think if like the main goal is consistently getting reactions, you're not really doing the work as a creative right? Because you're not in it. You're just in it to win it, but you're not actually in it. You're not allowing yourself to surrender to it because you're just hyped up and thinking how other people will receive it. And that I think infects um, the art. I think it, I think it hurts it from yeah. having its full experience, you know, because the art that you're creating, anything that you're creating, whether, like you said, if you're a cook, if you, if you're a painter, if if you're an architect, if you're a doctor and you have to come up with diagnosis, you know, um, anything that you're doing where you have to sort of tinker for a while to get to that place that feels like, wow, this is something interesting, this is new, requires a certain amount of self-reflection and also a piece of the self, an, an authentic piece of the self has to rise to the to the top to get to that place. Otherwise it just becomes muddled. You know, it, it doesn't have that quality of like what you're really trying to interject into it, your perspective, your story, your narrative, everything that goes into it, all of your emotions, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, a few years back, I was doing these yearly seminars with nursing students that were, that were, going for their PhDs, who were going to become professors of nursing at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And and one of the professors that was heading the program, she called me and said, you know, I have to ask you something. And our, our people are going to be graduating. They're going to be writing their thesis papers. And I'm wondering if you could come up with something to uh, to help them with that to create, I guess, to use the word resilience in them, because it's going to be difficult. And uh, what I did was have the, the students, and you know, they were probably in their late 20s and 30s by this point, men and women, think back to, to an experience that they'd had that drew them into nursing in the first place. It could be from childhood or whenever it was, and really sort of think about that. Now, the thesis papers are scientific, so they're not going to really be able to use, you know, artful depictions of this whole thing, but to infuse the people with a desire and a recollection of what 
drew them. And one story which stands out, you know, from the rest, there was a woman who was working in in uh, the Central Valley, um, and she came upon this girl. Maybe she was sixteen who had been, you know, sexually assaulted, raped actually by a by one of the foremen. She was a, an Hispanic young woman. And this <clears throat> nursing st student at the time, she, she, she walked this woman through the whole process and got her treatment, got her help, and, and they became close friends, this woman and this Latina girl. And uh, she started writing a song about this. That's what I had them do. And it was very emotional to hear all these stories. And the idea wasn't so much that you know, she's going to weave that into her thesis, which would have no place, but that she would feel this sense of desire and will once again, which I think promotes the resilience. And she was certainly able to use it when she was defending the thesis and when she was applying for a job, that she could tell this very real emotional story which led her to change her posture, her breathing, when we're saying something that's real as opposed to whatever, you know, phoning it in. You know, she she's a professor somewhere in the in the UC system at this point. But but it's re, you know, thinking about creativity, it's such a broad thing. And it isn't, it's not the provenance of artistes and creative types with little goatees that might wife's friend once said it's a little cry for help you know it's everybody the mail carrier as you said the doctor there's no point in anyone's life that creativity which is really just the dissembling of the sense of self-judgment can occur that's what we're talking about that's where resilience really lives and when people are going through great challenges, perhaps the hack is to really rely on the creativity of relating to one another, to find one person that you love and that loves you back. And 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 ask to, you know, cling on to that person for a spell. Always about love. It always comes back to that. It does. I mean, it's, you know, it can be a treacly thing. Um, you know, I mentioned before, I, I have a lot of experience working with, you know, soldiers, special forces, people, and they're talking about this stuff all the time. And it's not, I don't think men have a hard time talking about this, by the way. I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. It could be that they don't have the opportunity. But once given the opportunity, they go for it in a second. I know that from experience. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's not it's not unmanly. Believe me, it it is it is an axiom of manliness. It's just that we I actually just, think men have a, an easier time talking about it than women do. Could be. I mean, I'm not sure. There's a lot of shame that is invested in uh, rearing a, a girl mm. in terms of allowing her to fully embrace her willingness to feel love, experience love, express love. Do you Not think any. it's societal that now women are sort of looked upon to become what used to be thought as masculine, you know, to sort of assume that role of imperviousness to deep emotions and things. You know, that was a There's thing a that lot, was foisted on men, you know, John Wayne type of thing, which I'm sure John Wayne wept plenty of times in the shower himself. I mean, in, in privacy, there was no such thing as such a person. Well, I think, you know, just by the fact that women are, you know, they're in the corporate world, they're, there's a perspective within corporate America that women are supposed to 
uh, do the opposite of what they're built to do, which is be stoic. When women are not stoic creatures, we feel things, we're intuitive, we're emotional creatures, but somehow or other, the message of be emotional got a bad rap, right? So people talk about women as emotional in a derogatory way. And so the things that make us superhuman is now all of a sudden need to be in check. Right. It's super it, broken because it what 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 people don't rec- recognize is that allowing a woman to be her full self actually contributes to society in ways that are way more healthy and and just more it creates more success in every area, you know. If you tell a woman curtail your intuition because you shouldn't trust it, well, you're actually creating a really big problem because that intuition is supposed to help you. A man who eschews his wife's intuitive sense about him does so at his own grave peril. And I, yes. I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> this could be another whole topic. Oh, that sure. We- okay, man, we can keep on <laughs> doing it. We could. Um, this has been so good. Thank you, Peter, for your perspective on. We didn't talk about hacks, but there no, there is a hack. No, you can talk about them all you want. Just spell it H A X. It's just a different. Yeah, this is yeah the the ha- the H A X hacks in um, determining your ability to rise above the clouds to become more invested in seeing the spirituality and seeing the happy accidents in moving through wonderment and finding your your voice, but not relying on others to determine it, but also inviting others in and experiencing it. Did we cover, did I cover it all? I'm like, I've loved the summary. I'm going to take notes. That summary? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. And before we go, is there anything you're working on that people should know about? Because you're always working on wonderful things. So what, what are you working on now? Well, right now, I have a new album coming out. We have a Kickstarter campaign, and Mm -hmm. I'm going to put on my shilling hat and voice for this. Um, I have a group of some of my, probably my best friends in the world, and I haven't recorded with them in 30 years. The last time we recorded was 1993. Uh, The record was Skin, came out on Epic Records. And I assembled them all to play together again. And the record is fantastic. It's called At the Emergence of Stars. And uh, you can put it on your thing. It's starskickstarter.peterhimmelman.com. And we will have that link in the show notes. So you guys can Or is can it at peterhimmelman.com? I can't remember. It's something like that. I'll let we'll you. make sure to have the link in the show notes so people Let's can go ahead it. and get on there. It. Yeah, hacks. This is your hacks, guys. Go on and get inspired by listening to Peter's album. I'm very excited about the upcoming album. And uh, guys, go ahead and donate. Be part of it. Participate in this uh, expression of wonderment and search for curiosity. <laughs> Amen, sister. All right, Peter. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon, Paula. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.